Hi everybody, Cousin Vinny Agnello, critically acclaimed author of uh, The Devil's Glove, Christian Favorite. And uh, welcome to the Bedtime with Cousin Vinny series where we're reading, oh, about 180 pages of The Devil's Glove, my Christian classic, and of course not all at one time. 15 minute segments, that's what you're going to have, a whole lot of videos, it's going to be quite a tease and uh, you should enjoy it. Um, anyway, by the time we're done, you'll have a chance to purchase the book, autographed at a very reasonable rate, and uh, we'll send you someplace or give you an address to be able to purchase the book. Anyway, let's get on with the book. Let's stop talking and start reading. Last night, I left you guys off at uh, page 66 of the Devil's Club. This is the second edition of the Devil's Glove, and uh, uh, if I do believe Eddie is in his room uh, looking at his new glove that he found, the magical glove, and uh, comparing it to his modern baseball heroes that are on his wall, this is when um, the phone rang. The phone rang abruptly Disturbing the moment's peace and tranquility, and Eddie picked up the receiver. Hello? Hi, Eddie. What do you want, Johnny? Eddie asked in an unfriendly tone of voice. Well, excuse me. My father told me to call you and tell you that we're having practice the day after tomorrow. So, are you going to be there? Sure. What time? 4.30 for you. He says that you and Billy Ray both need some extra batting practice. I concurred wholeheartedly, Johnny asked, answered arrogantly. Yeah, well, did he include you on the list too? No. Now, why would he do something like that? Everybody knows that I'm the best hitter on the team. Johnny needled. Not for long. Oh, yeah? Well, who do you propose is going to take away my title? Johnny asked, stunned by Eddie's reply. Me. You? Johnny chuckled. What is this, some kind of episode of Candid Camera? I've got it. This is one of those goof calls being recorded for one of those morning radio shows. Yeah, think what you want, but you'll see. You're serious, aren't you? What a joke. You know something, Eddie Romano? When I first met you, I thought you were a nice kid. A lousy ball player, but a nice kid. But do you know what I think now? Johnny asked condescendingly. No, and quite frankly, I don't give a damn. The next thing Johnny heard was the sound of a dial tone. And he stared down in amazement at the phone receiver he had just hung up. He marveled over his newly found courage. He didn't know why he had this feeling that he could actually do the things he was saying. He just knew that he felt that he could. And that was making all the difference in the world to him. He got up off his bed and inserted that new cassette into his boombox. Lou Gehrig's famous farewell speech from Yankee Stadium blared out through the speakers. Remembering what his father had said about Gehrig made the speech very touching to him. It just didn't seem fair to him that this humble voice was, dis it was extinguished at such an early age. And he started to say a prayer for poor Lou Gehrig and also prayed that he would never die from disease. He reasoned that death by disease was unnatural and therefore painful. And he knew firsthand that he didn't want anything to do with pain. He flashed back to when he was five years old and had, got, and had to get his tonsils removed. He remembered in vivid detail that painful ordeal and how his parents had tricked him into going to the hospital. 
Before he allowed the doctors to anesthetize him, he was assured by his parents that this was standard procedure for an astronaut before taking a trip into space. And he recalled how he woke up the next morning with the worst sore throat of his life. He thought if it was that he thought it was a really mean trick and he felt that experience had made him an expert on pain. If Garrick had suffered anything like that, Eddie surmised, he must have welcomed death. And he looked up Lou Gehrig's statistics in the baseball encyclopedia and was thoroughly impressed. He sat down and compared his statistics with Hank Aaron's and concluded that Gehrig was a Hank Aaron type power hitter with a much higher batting average. All this research was making him very tired. His eyes became very heavy and his mind started to wander off toward destinations unknown. It was like watching a continuous movie marathon of different faces and voices with very little plot to the stories until suddenly Eddie found himself looking into a bedroom. Its furnishings were very old, reminding him of that background set for that television show, Leave it to Beaver. This room contained an early model black and white television set that rested upon a beat up old oak writing table. In this bedroom, an intelligible drama was taking place. This was definitely a baseball player's room. Posted on the walls were many newspaper clippings of accounts of games. The teams they referred to, though, were not recognizable. Resting upon a cheap dresser was Eddie's green baseball glove. A guy wearing an old-fashioned baseball uniform was lying in bed. He was restlessly tossing and turning. He kept repeating the same phrases over and over again as if he was trying to brainwash himself. He repeated monotonously, I'm finally going to the majors and I'd rather die than come back here. Eddie observed and listened to the monotone speech of the ball player until finally another voice could be heard. Would you really rather die than go back to the minor leagues? You better believe it, the ball player responded, sounding almost like he was sleepwalking. I'm not so sure. I don't think you've got the guts to harm yourself, the voice goaded. You'd be surprised at the kind of guts you develop after 14 years down here, the ball player whispered with his eyes completely closed. I'm not convinced. I don't think your heart is in it. I think you're used to this place. This has become your home. You've got a minor leaguer's mentality. You've really got no pride anymore. What in hell do you know? I'm telling you that I'll kill myself before I ever get sent back down here again. And I mean it. Nobody's going to be able to talk me out of this, the ball player argued passionately. Do you swear it? The voice laughed in complete ecstasy. Yes, I swear it. I'd even shake on it. Face it, if your word is no good, then you're no good, the ball player theorized. Those are words of wisdom, my boy. Those are truly words of wisdom. I'll probably, I'll probably live to regret this because it goes against my better judgment to trust you or anybody else for that matter, but I'm going to give you a chance. I'm going to bless this gaudy mitt of yours and give you what you've always wanted out of life. But if you renege on me and our agreement you will spend all of eternity regretting the moment you did. And that's not a threat, my young disciple. That is a promise. And I will see to it that you will live up to your end of the bargain. 
and I will get my pound of flesh if you don't. So don't even let the thought of cheating me cross your mind. Just remember, your handshake signifies a binding contract with me. Now it's time to shake on it, the dark man said with exuberance. The ball player stopped rambling about killing himself and fell back asleep and soon after Eddie saw a very distinguished looking man in a dark suit appear at his bedside. The man in black leaned over the sleeping ball player and grasped onto his right hand, shaking it severely. He then forced the player's hand into the baseball glove that Eddie found. The ball player woke up suddenly, but the man in black was nowhere to be found. The ball player looked amazed as he stared down at his right hand and saw that he was wearing his dolled up glove. What a weird dream that one was. I could almost swear someone was shaking my hand. Wow, and how did my glove get on my hand? I swear it was on the desk when I went to bed. Something funny's going on around here. But I'm just too tired and too depressed to worry about it now. God, I really hate my life, the ball player declared in frustration and self-pity as he fell back to sleep. Suddenly, Eddie jumped up. He must have dozed off. He thought, now that's a cool dream. He got up turned off the lights, and dropped the baseball encyclopedia on the floor. He then closed his eyes again, hoping to resume that dream. And he never caught up with that first dream ever again. It shared the same destiny of most dreams, becoming lost in the thoughts of the waking mind. But other dreams would become prevalent, and the details of those dreams would never be forgotten. Next chapter, Sleeping Your Life Away. Eddie went to school, but it seemed to all who knew him that he was just sleepwalking through it. He was going through the motions of being an ordinary middle school kid, and that's all. He would sit in his classroom, literally stare out the window, and not take a single note. He had no interest in school anymore. As far as the world was concerned, they could clearly see that he had decided to become a dropout. His teacher stared curiously over at him, wondering what had gone wrong. His whole attitude had changed overnight, and let me add, not for the better. He used to be a very good student. He was attentive and answered questions in class, but now he was unresponsive. He told them not to bother him and just sat there fiddling with his old antique baseball glove. Mrs. West, his English teacher, was so alarmed by this new behavior that she wrote down in her daily planner that a parent-teacher conference needed to be arranged immediately. She had asked Eddie for his essay, and he had flippantly told her to bug off. Eddie had never been disrespectful to his elders before. Mercifully, as far as Eddie was concerned, the final bell rang, and he and his classmates stampeded toward the awaiting school buses. Eddie quickly boarded his bus and sat impatiently waiting to get home. He never said a word to anyone. It was almost like he was being drawn into his own private, private fantasy world. It was a world of obsession. That glove literally was all that Eddie was concerned with anymore. He held it in a vice grip and never let it out of his sight. As soon as he got home, he raced up the stairs to his bedroom and shouted down to his mother that he needed to take a nap. Mrs. Romano ran up the stairs after him and inquired, Is there something wrong, Eddie? No, Mom. Everything's great. 
I just need re need to rest. It was a long day at school, and, and I'm still worn out from that treasure hunt that Dad and I went on yesterday, Eddie asserted. I didn't get a chance to tell you, but I really like your mint. I felt like wringing your father's neck for bringing you to such a dangerous spot, but you two certainly were, re were rewarded. I don't think I've ever seen a glove quite like that, like that one. It is really cool. I don't think I've ever liked anything as much as I like it. I wouldn't sell it no matter what. It's one of a kind. I, can, I can't believe how lucky I've been. I'm the luckiest kid in the whole world, Mom, Eddie declared as he jumped off his bed